Welcome to another unit in this SPSS course. In this unit, I'm going to talk about how we can use the R essentials for SPSS to test for structural breaks in our data. Well, maybe you never heard about the R essentials. So that's like a plugin add-on for SPSS, which allows for additional functionalities. If you want to know how to install this, or rather how to actually get this in the first place, you can visit the corresponding unit in this course. At this point, however, I assume you already installed them. And then you can also select there, test for structural breaks. If you installed them, activated them, you can find them here at analyze, regression, then structural change detection. While this actually works for whole linear regression models, so you see I have a dependent and a list of independent variables. I can also use this in a context, for example, of a time series by just entering the time series variable as my dependent variable to test whether there is a structural break in this variable. Here it makes sense to use more than just one of these tests. Why? That's what we're going to see in a moment. Down here, I could also use a different version that I go with show tests. I will leave this blank for the moment. So I will just select the upper ones. Of course, aside from the tests up here, they also provide me with some diagrams with illu which illustrate the functionalities. And the tests can always be read in a way that I take a look at the p-values and interpret them in a way that they say, well, if the value is larger than 5%, then there is no significant structural break. Whereas if the values are smaller than 5%, then there is a significant structural break. Well, here in this context, I wouldn't have like this clear cut of a picture. Some of the text, uh, tests say no, there is no structural break, whereas some say, yeah, there is a clear structural break. But let's have a look at the graphics. Well, here it's still within reasonable boundaries. So that's why the test said, no, there's no structural break. But I see that the development changes around 0 0.6 or around 60% of my data set. It goes slightly upward and it goes downward. So let's keep this in mind, go to the next test here, which actually turned out and told us that there is a structural break. So here in this part, I'm actually above this critical line. So I'll leave this interval defined by the two critical levels. And again, this is at level or at 0 0.6, 60% of my time horizon. Because at first I'm going upwards and I'm going downwards. So it's similar to what I saw here. Second one, I see a similar result. Uh, third one, see a similar result. I'm within boundaries. That's why the test said no structural break. But around 0 0.6, something significant happened. With the next one. Same structure, goes slightly up, then there's a significant structural break, but not as significant that it's with up, out, or outside of these thresholds, but it's still something is happening here at around 0 0.6, and then it continues at a different level. Next one, again to the second, similar to the second, upwards movement, downwards movement, and here I'm outside my critical boundaries at around 0 0.6. Finally, the last one, similar to two of the other tests. While I'm within my boundaries, I still see that someone uh, something happened at 0 0.6. So if I take only the test results up here, they might, on an overall picture, rather indicate as 
four out of six cases say no structural break, no significant structural break, that I do not have a problem with structural breaks. Only two of them tell me, yeah, there could be a problem with structural breaks. However, the picture that those graphics paint might indicate that I should actually consider there to be some kind of structural break at roughly yeah, 0 0.6, so 60%, 55% of the whole time horizon. So something in between here might have happened. So this is at least, this valids at least a closer look at this specific point in time. And well, that's done already everything I wanted to mention with regard to these structural change tests, to the first ones. Because as I said earlier, this? we could also go down here and perform a set of chow tests. Here, however, I have to define a starting case and an ending case. So let's, for example, say I start at five and test up to case number 10. And he considers only this interval. And here he tells me it's clearly not with, or clearly above the critical threshold. So in other words, this part indicates that w between observation five and six, there's no structural break. If I were to, well, expand this a little bit. So I'm going back here and say, observe between one, let's say 45, 48. And I see here at this point, somewhere in the back part, something happens. Because what I see here as well, I'm now more or less at the point where the critical part happens. So around 0 0.55, 0 0.6. And even at this point, he tells me, ah, there's supposedly a, critic, uh, a structural break. So let's expand this a bit more even. So let's go up to 96 and I see again around 0 0.6 he detects a critical structural break. If I want to study this in more detail I could for example break this down from 55 to 65 and I see this in more detail in how far this actually well uh, looks in close detail. However, well, in the end, the show test version simply means I do not have to consider all the things at once. I can focus on specific areas of all of this, defined by the different observations. If I go from minimum to maximum, this will look comparable to the test we did before. And well, could be, however, then easily be used as we did here to say, well, in this interval, there's no structural break, nothing critical going on. In this area, from observation 1 to 84, there actually something starts to happen. And if I consider the longer time horizon, here I clearly have a structural break which should be treated accordingly. And this then also covers the part with the show test and concludes this session on detecting structural breaks. As I said, well, this is usually a good idea to go with for time series, but you could use this in a general context of linear regression models as well. However, that's not topic of this unit. So I hope you enjoyed the part I presented here. And if you're looking for additional insights, not only on working with time series, but on working with SPSS in general, then feel free to visit the rest of this course or have a look at the corresponding playlist.
I say goodbye and see you next time.